So, uh, I told you who I am. Hi everyone, I'm Kynan. I'm a meditation teacher from Sydney, Australia. <coughs> um, I've been studying with Tucker for the past few years. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited to be here and to see you all. <coughs> so, um, what I'd like to do is we'll start with a talk on the uh, on the topic and overview. I'm just curious, did anybody have any specific angle, something they particularly wanted to learn today? Yeah. Well, what's your name? Uh, Cindy. Cindy? Oh, wait, we're talking online. Oh, yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, since the topic is meditation and psychology, I'm just curious how meditation how does focusing on breath change your brain? Oh, yeah, okay. I will try to get to that. Yeah. What's it? Uh, Ori. Hi, Ori. And I was kind of curious recently about integrating our shadow. Um, conveniently we have a pen here. Uh, anybody else have an angle besides for the general? Yeah, Jason. Um, how to achieve stream entry? <laughs> uh, tall order for two hours, but um, uh, I, if anybody leaves here enlightened, I do expect a tip. <laughs> What's your name? Matt. Matt. Um, yeah, I'm wondering how um, you see the two topics relating to the practice of psychotherapy, maybe using this practice. Using meditation in psychotherapy? Yeah. Um, cool, great. So I'm going to start out with the uh, intro talk, and uh, I'll, I'll set up the theme here, and then we'll move into some practices. So um, it feels important, particularly for like the comments section in YouTube, <laughs> to clarify that psychology and dharma are, are vast. So psychology is something like the study and manipulation of human experience, and that's essentially everything. In fact, if there were something other than human experience, it would not be possible to know that. <laughs> and so, uh, psychology is vast, there are many different schools, they disagree on a lot. And similarly, even just the Pali canon, come on in. She's gonna stay outside because she's a dog and we can't have dogs. Oh! So she's just gonna chill right there. Okay, but I love dogs. I know, we love dogs too. <laughs> Your dog is mentally in here with us. <laughs> or is, is that allowed? <laughs> can, dog, can dog spiritually <laughs> dogs are okay. Um, so, and as far as Dharma, just the Pali Canon, so this is the oldest surviving texts attributed to the Buddha, just the Pali Canon is something like 10 or 15,000 pages. It would be like a shelf in the library. So um, there's not any kind of silver bullet where you could say the Dharma says this, because even that vast amount of text is just the Pali Canon, right? There's then tens of thousands of pages of semi-canonical commentary, plus many later schools. So uh, anything I'm gonna say, you could easily find a sutta that uh, contradicts the thing that I'm saying. And so uh, I mean these simply as broad generalizations when I'm talking about the distinction between Dharma and, and uh, psychology. Uh, so one distinction is going to be the aim so the Buddha does say frequently, I, I, or famously, I teach two things. Anybody know the two things? Yeah, dukkha and the cessation of dukkha. <clears throat> uh, I think probably stress is my favorite translation for dukkha because the, the path is promising an end to stress and an end to suffering doesn't exactly make sense even in the Buddhist canon. Um, the Buddha seems pretty sad when his friends are dying, when he knows he's dying, uh, when he gets injured. Uh, the Buddha gets pretty angry when people misbehave and has some choice insults for people and, and <laughs> things like that. So uh, the Buddha sort of teaches stress and the end of stress. Uh, but often when people say to you what happened under the Bodhi tree, the Buddha talks about awakening, enlightenment, uh, this total mental transformation. That is the cessation of Tanha is the Pali word. 
uh, or sometimes talk about the three poisons of greed, hatred, and ignorance, or delusion, that these things are extinguished under the Bodhi tree. And um, I won't ask you to raise your hand and say who's been to therapy, but I imagine most of the hands would go up. And um, if I asked you to keep your hand up, if your therapist has said, on your treatment plan here, I'm going to write the complete overcoming of greed, hatred, and delusion <laughs> towards total awakening, probably all the hands would go down because I don't think any of you have been in my clinic. <laughs> <clears throat> Enlightenment or no money back. Um, <laughs> sorry, I haven't totally overcome greed. Um, <laughs> I'm working on it. Uh, Sigmund Freud actually said that the purpose of psychology, of psychotherapy, was converting neurotic misery into ordinary unhappiness. <laughs> and, and while I think in the hundred or so years since he said that, we have set our sights a bit higher, um, what we're largely talking about as the goal in psychology is something along the lines of self-actualization. So it's overcoming some degree of stress, overcoming some degree of uh, mental disease, stepping on your own two feet, and being kind of the best you that you can be. This is actually very different from the way that the Buddhist scriptures or traditional Buddhist teachers would talk about these things. Uh, you will never hear traditional Buddhist teachers talking about being your best self. Uh, that would, in Buddhist terms, be almost heresy. Uh, you don't have a self in, in Buddhist terms. So the goal between the two approaches is pretty different. Another thing that's going to be different is the methodology, particularly with respect to mental content. So there's a line in several places in the Pali Canon. Uh, you'll find in the Dhammapada, which is maybe the most famous. Uh, uh, it's sort of like the book of Proverbs in the, the Pali Canon. It's a, a bunch of short, pithy sayings you can easily memorize. And one of them is something like, do not even think the phrase, he abused me. Someone who thinks this will never overcome hatred. And uh, that's a very different model than what we would use in psychotherapy, right? Imagine telling a therapist you'd been abused and then being like, ooh, don't say that out loud. Even thinking about that is bad for you, right? Just stop all thoughts related to the trauma. This is in fact largely the opposite of what you would get if you go see a therapist, that in psychotherapy, um, we deeply care about content. There are some exceptions, there are schools of therapy around how you relate to the content, but largely if you go to a therapist, you're gonna talk about yourself and how your mind works. And in Dharma, you're really not supposed to do that. <clears throat> um, is anybody here sort of brand new has almost no meditation experience? Cool. Most, <laughs> my, my fiance in the back there is abashedly waving to me. <laughs> he just comes to these things because I'm teaching them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got distracted. What were we, <laughs> what were we talking about? So um, <clears throat> uh, when, you, when you go to see a therapist, you will talk about yourself. In meditation, the instructions are usually along the lines of ignore everything about yourself, right? The first meditation instructions you were likely to have ever gotten is focus on something, probably your breath, and take all of your thoughts and just ignore them. We don't care if they're good thoughts or bad thoughts, just drop them. These are pretty complementary, uh, these are pretty different modalities. And I would say pretty complementary modalities. I don't know how many hands we'll get when, I, when we take this in Melbourne, but I suspect we'll get a lot here in Berkeley. Do you know anyone who's been to therapy too much and it shows? <laughs> yeah, I thought we would get some hands. Uh, I have a few patients where it seems like for any interaction they and someone they're dating have, there's then like, 40 minutes, for a minute of interaction, there's 40 minutes of discussing the meaning of the interaction, whether they're a good fit in the future of their relationship and whether they will spiritually grow together. So there is this problem <clears throat> of spending too much time looking at your mental content, right? 
it can become quite a uh, uh, narcissistic in the more original meaning, where it's the 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 Greek narcissist just can't stop staring at his own reflection in the pool, right? So there's this, this risk, this damage of spending too much time looking at what's going on in your mind. Um, there's also a pretty significant risk of, of not looking at it. Um, Kynan's portion of the talk, I think, will focus a lot more on, on that side. Uh, that it's, uh, in short, it's what we would call spiritual bypassing. Is anybody familiar with that term? Lots of people, okay. And, and so the idea of spiritual bypassing is just ignoring all your feelings. Because they're just things that arise and pass away. And then I had a teacher who would just like, you know, be so cruel to somebody. And then give a talk and say, I don't experience anger. <laughs> I was like, I don't think he's lying. I actually think he doesn't know. <laughs> I think he's just cultivated so much distance from the content that the content is a dumpster fire and it's just like there's just no way to tell. <laughs> the promise of the Dharma is that you actually don't need the content. That, you know, I've heard particularly uh, the basically oldest generation of American teachers were boomers, so people who are now in the 70s and 80s for the most part. And the boomers ex almost exclusively learned from traditional teachers, Asian people living in Asia. The boomers would have had to travel there because there weren't any meditation teachers here until the 70s, right? And um, traveling there, you would really, from every story I've heard, be encouraged to truly ignore your psychological content. This does largely seem to be the path. And I just, I've been teaching for a long time. I'm pretty confident I've had over a thousand people in my retreats. Um, I mean, over the course of 50 retreats there, we, we actually keep them quite small. You get lots of attention. Um, <laughs> but over the course of lots of retreats, uh, you know, I think it's been over a thousand people. And I just don't see a case in Westerners, or I think maybe what I mean is globalized people. Western is kind of a vague term. Uh, globalized people uh, would be definitely all of you and probably almost everybody you know. Uh, the one globalized culture that's created a sort of uniform, you know, I, I see therapy patients uh, and meditation students all over the world, and there's sort of a pretty uniform among the kind of people who would see an online Dharma psychologist. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter where you are, you're part of this one sort of globalized culture. And at least in the globalized psyche, I just don't see any examples of ignoring the content being sufficient in the way that the Dharma and the, uh, I think many of the teachers I've heard of, promised that ignoring the content would be. Uh, Jack Kornfield tells this amazing story about ignoring the content, where he's with a monk uh, in, I think it's in Thailand, and the monk says he's going to go light himself on fire in protest. So Jack starts interviewing the monk about, you know, what a rash, uh, brave decision. What, how did you reach that? And the monk eventually confesses, I fell in love with this woman and I'm a celibate monk. And the only course of action I could conceive of was setting myself on fire, so that's my plan. <laughs> and so Jack actually later became a psychologist on account of what he was seeing. And so he actually wound up convincing the monk to talk to the woman and they decided it wasn't gonna work out. Um, and I've asked a bunch of elder teachers, what's going on, you know? Why is it that what the Dharma is preaching really does work, right? Can you raise your hand if the Dharma has really worked for you? Cool. I like to ask my students. Suppose that, you know, uh, uh, the ghost of Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama and the Buddha, you know, they all sit you down and they say, hey, we have a confession to make. This is all bullshit. Um, <laughs> we, we, we needed to make some money and we made this up. Meditation does nothing. Would you stop practicing? And everybody I've asked to that says, no, definitely not. You know, this has worked enough for me that that wouldn't convince me. I would keep going even if all my mentors said this was, <laughs> this was a big lie they were telling. Um, so the Dharma certainly works. It does seem to uproot quite a good deal 
of psychological content, as well as what we might call transpersonal content. So the Dharma, I would say, is much more focused on transpersonal versus what in psychotherapy would be personal. Transpersonal meaning the Four Noble Truths apply the same to me as they do to you, and my childhood trauma doesn't apply to you at all. Um, no, my brother's not here. So... <laughs> <laughs> that was a decent joke. I liked that one. <laughs> um, so the thing I had been wondering, asking all these elder teachers about is, you know, we've all seen so much progress through the Dharma, both in the transpersonal, you know, the root of awakening, of overcoming delusion, of overcoming craving, and in the personal route, uh, Dharma made me a lot less crazy than I used to be. And we've all found it insufficient. It did not make us enough less crazy than we used to be. And so the question was, what's going on? Were sort of the Buddhist masters gritting their teeth and just bypassing everything? And I would say there is some historical evidence for that. Um, misbehaving powerful gurus is not a purely Western phenomenon. I, I got to teach in Bhutan one time, and in, in the, the kingdom of Bhutan, they, uh, they, they use the, the guru system largely. And I was talking to this governor there about the guru system, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't support the guru system in the West. Westerners can't behave with that much power. And he said, yeah, Easterners don't do so well either. But I, I don't think that's it. I don't think this would have been uh, passed down over all these generations and all these brilliant teachers with all their brilliant writing if they're just kind of gritting their teeth, misbehaving and, and ignoring stuff. Um, I think a much more likely situation is the Buddha is living in a time where uh, almost everybody is a peasant farmer. Uh, you're going to marry, you know, one of the five eligible people in your village because uh, you don't really leave your village. If you imagine being a Nepali farmer 2,500 years ago, it is astounding that there are transpersonal aspects of your psyche that are as accurate today as they were then. The magnitude of the Buddha's insights are astounding. It also makes a lot of sense to other factors. Our psychology has components that theirs did not, certainly that would seem pretty hard to argue with. And also, I think probably most, if not all of us coming here, would approach Buddha with what we could call a non-religious lens, right? So um, as much respect as we would have for Newton, we would not like reject Einstein on the grounds that he disagreed with Newton because we believe in progress and learning, right? So if we think of the Buddha as a genius rather than a god, the idea that we've learned new things about the human mind in the last 2,500 years seems essentially certain. <laughs> and this is, to me, what the progression of Buddhism uh, over the years has looked like. Uh, for instance, in the earliest form of Buddhism, the term consciousness has this very like, simple meaning to it. The Buddha says, oh, I've always said Vishnana. And Lee Brisington told me I'm putting an extra letter in there. Vinyana, Vinyana. is the Pali word. Vishnana is uh, Sanskrit, he told me. Anyways, the Pali word Vinyana for consciousness, the Buddha says, well, there are six of them. Eye consciousness, ear consciousness. It's the five senses and then mind consciousness. Consciousness is just of an object. Uh, the idea that there might be an unconscious mind is sort of vaguely alluded to by the term Alaya and the Abhidhamma a few hundred years later. Uh, <clears throat> And then if you look at the, the newest forms of Buddhism are going to be these Vajrayana uh, Tibetan sects, the psychology has gotten a lot more advanced. They're actually talking about emotions, working with particular emotions, um, amping up emotions, uh, deities personifying emotions, in, in a way that has a lot more uh, depth to it. So I, I think this is why... I believe without exception, every Dharma teacher I've ever known has spent a while in therapy. Um, I, I think this is probably why Dharma alone is transformative and feels like ultimately not enough. Dharma practice seems to uh, help psychotherapy an awful lot. 
So as a psychologist, <clears throat> uh, probably 80% of my patients are advanced meditators because they just sort of know my name and I don't have to advertise for them and it's convenient. <laughs> so, um, I, but I try to keep about 20% of my caseload just uh, random people looking for therapists because the meditators are too good at therapy. I don't want to get I don't want to get rusty by just working with people who are too good at it. Uh, there's at least two ways in which they're too good at it. One is access to mental content, you know. So often when I get people off the internet <clears throat> and I say, "What are you feeling?" It's like, could you rephrase that in the form of a math problem? <laughs> uh, most of the people that I work with actually have to be taught how to answer the question, "What are you feeling?" Uh, it seems, at least in globalized world, there's no emotional education at all. And people just don't know what they're feeling at all. Whereas when you work with meditators, I can say, what are you feeling? And just, I have to often be kind of aggressive because I could just sit back for uh, 50 minutes or as my people call it, an hour. And, <laughs> and uh, just let them write essays upon essays on their feelings. So the Dharma gives you way more ability to access the content. The Dharma also will make the, the practice of the Dharma will make the content feel like it is not you. So things that are so ugly, you couldn't say them out loud. My Dharma people can just, oh, I just had this horrifying thought that would have, you know, cause me to be excluded from society if anyone ever heard it besides you. Here's what it is. What do you think it means? Uh, so what we're learning is mindfulness, right? Which is this direct observation of what's going on. And largely in Dharma, we are not looking at the content, right? We're looking at uh, body sensations arising and passing away, thoughts arising and passing away, maybe images. But turning this onto psychological content, you can actually get really quickly rich volumes of information. And then we're also practicing anatta, right? Non-self. All of this content arising, uh, you didn't decide it would be there, you can't decide it won't be there. It comes from causes and conditions, right? Things that happened when you were a kid, your genetics, and so on. It's just there. So uh, this tends to make us Dharma people uh, really good at therapy and efficient. Um, I think I'm about ready to turn it over to Kynan. The thing I want to close with is, so we have these two complementary paths. Uh, people often say, you know, which one should I be using? And the answer is something along the lines of both, but also don't forget yoga, like it's really important to keep the body engaged. And you'll need some Tai Chi, because yoga like really doesn't move the energy enough. And like, it's California, you should probably be dosing ayahuasca on the weekends. And, 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 and essentially the answer becomes, there's so many things you should do. And uh, when I teach anywhere else in the world, I say, you know, most of us have jobs and relationships. Um, here in the Bay Area, seems like a lot of people don't really have jobs, but <laughs> um, uh, most of us, at least most places in the world, are just too busy to do too much uh, self-improvement work in a given day. So which one is better? Um, uh, even though I am a psychologist, I'm usually on Team Dharma. The analogy I use most often is imagine that you live by a gross pond. It's filled with mosquitoes and algae, and it's there's not the fun pond. You can't like go in the sauna and then jump in it afterwards. There's no fishing. I just need to set up the image. This pond sucks, okay? And <laughs> so you live next to this awful pond. And the only implement you have is a bucket. What do you do? Well, probably two things, right? The first is start draining the pond. The second is get used to living next to a gross pond because it's not going anywhere anytime soon. This is precisely what, you know, having spent 20 years walking both of these paths, this is pretty precisely what it's felt like. The psychotherapy path to me has felt absolutely necessary. There will be times when I practice just banging my head against a wall, 
where lots of practice is just increasing suffering because I don't know how to cope with something, I can't see something. That actually hasn't happened in many years. I, I sort of started a lineage that was just Dharma will solve all your problems and that solves some problems and augmented others. Um, it has felt like over the years of working with my mental content, I'm just getting less and less crazy things that would have, <clears throat> you know, I, I used to get these depressions when I was a kid that would go nine months or something. And as an adult, you know, if I get them two days, three days, there are things that used to trigger me that I can't even remember why, you know? Um, but as I keep draining my pond here, I notice two things. It's a bucket on a pond, right? It is not draining very slowly. And I don't know how deep this pond goes, except to say very. <laughs> so uh, I'm awfully glad for the time that I spent draining the pond. But it doesn't look like it's going to be dry land anytime soon. And so living near the pond, getting good at living near the pond, it doesn't actually matter how much water is in the pond. That's why if you're picking one, all things being equal, I would pick Team Dharma. Um, it's just dealing with all of the suffering at once, whereas the content is this one, this one, this one, this one, and there's a lot of this one. I say all things being equal. Uh, you will assuredly find times in which all things are not equal. I have, uh, who has been on a meditation retreat? Whoa! Katie, what a cool place you've invented yeah, here. <laughs> <clears throat> so I would say particularly on retreat, I've just like watched psychological complexes evaporate, you know? Uh, and sometimes they just don't. There have been things that I've needed like, that was one thing I needed two years of talking about the content before I could get any space around it. Anytime I would start Probably almost everybody's familiar with the word jhana here. It's like an a intense, a intense sort of concentrative trance state. Anytime we start getting into jhana, start getting into samadhi, I would just crash back down into the psychological content. If my mind relaxed, it would just go into the trauma and that was all it could do and I would lose days on retreat just being stuck in this tiny, closed little mind. So at least for myself, this is how I usually do it. Uh, if the Dharma practice is working, I run with it. And if it's not, I work on the content. Uh, I've been talking exclusively about <clears throat> content as something you do with a therapist. But uh, while that is often better, there, there's plenty of ways to work with content on your own. I think that's what I have to say about that. And what we're going to do is leave a, a, a long time for questions at the end. So uh, if there's like a word I'm using you don't understand, feel free to raise your hand, but otherwise we'll, we'll hold off a little bit. Uh, Can I just you want clarify to... the pond analogy? Yeah. Is it, are you saying that <coughs> Dharma is getting used to the pond? Yeah. Like psychotherapy is draining the pond? By buckets, yeah, that's right. Thanks. All right, want to take us in our first meditation? Yeah, let's, let's do, do it. it. <laughs> okay, so we'll do, uh, I'll guide us through a meditation It'll be about 15 minutes, so if you need to adjust your sitting posture, get any more props you need, um, maybe move around a little bit set up, go for it now. And in your posture, find a balance between being relaxed and alert. So making sure that you're in a position that is comfortable enough so you can be relaxed but not fall asleep. And make sure that the spine is relatively upright, relatively straight, so that there's a sense of steadiness and brightness. Once you've found your posture, do your best to remain still and quiet for the duration of the practice. And 
And so begin by coming into the present moment and just noticing what is making up your experience right now. So there's likely to be external sounds. It's also likely to be body sensations. Allow your awareness to be big and spacious, just taking in whatever is present for you right now. Here, notice some of the sensations of the body. Notice the feeling in your hands. Notice the feeling of being supported by the cushion or chair. attention to the sensations of the breath. Find one location where the sensations are relatively clear. So if you have an existing practice and you know what works for you, do that. You might like to Observe the rising and falling of the abdomen. Or perhaps you prefer the sensations of the breath at the edges of the nostrils or the sensations of, on the upper lip. And when you bring attention to these sensations, it's just deciding to have those sensations in the foreground, in the center of your experience. Try to also allow the mind to stay open and spacious. So we don't need to shut anything out, but we just place attention on the sensations of the breath. As you do this, there's very likely to be thoughts that arise. And we want to allow the thoughts to come, allow them to be there in the background, 
but we don't want to engage with them. Thoughts are just generally too sticky and we get caught up and uh, pulled away from what we're trying to do. So whenever thoughts come up, just allow them to be in the background and gently redirect attention to the sensations of the breath. So the trick here is that we want to skillfully ignore all thoughts. So there's going to be a whole range of different kinds of thoughts that come up for most people. Some thoughts will be beautiful, some will be ugly, some will demand your immediate attention, some will also be kind of disguised and they'll tell you that they're the one thought you really must think about. And we want to try and ignore all of the thoughts when we're doing this particular practice. And by ignoring all of the thoughts, ignoring all of the mental content, we can cultivate calm and clarity allowing the mind to settle and creating more spaciousness.
as you keep watching the mental content come up, the thoughts will continue to arise, pass away. Notice that it just keeps going. You didn't necessarily decide for the thoughts to arise. You can't necessarily control them, but you can, in those moments of awareness, you can decide to bring attention back. So anytime you notice what's happening, any moment of awareness, be glad for that and gently bring attention back to the sensations of the breath. That guiding should feel pretty familiar to most of you. It uh, was our demo of ignoring the content. Who here feels better than they did 15 minutes ago? Yeah. Usually there seems to be this golden like five-sixth ratio. No matter how many people ask that question to, it seems like about five-sixths of the time you're feeling better after the sit. So uh, we thought we'd do a demo of ignoring the content and then give you a sense of what it feels like to ignore the content. It's pretty delightful. So uh, Kaiden recently sat a month-long silent retreat um, and is going to tell you some things he learned there. Cool. So... Yeah, I, last year I sat a month long retreat. Um, it was in one of the uh, waves of the pandemic. <laughs> um, and I somehow managed to uh, get a friend's apartment uh, that I was able to stay in. Uh, they went and uh, lived with their parents for a month. Um, and uh, fortunately I had uh, Tucker and Upali uh, to guide me. Um, I wanna talk about this because uh, during that retreat, there was a whole range of different types of mental content that came up um, that was interesting and challenging to work with. Um, and I used a number of different approaches to work with it, sort of based on the guidance that I had. And um, I, think, I think a lot of it is quite relevant to um, how to approach content in meditation and how to um, use different meditative lenses or approaches to meditation um, to work with it uh, in, in different ways. So um, I have some examples of uh, the types of content that were, were coming up for me. Um, Tucker already talked a bit about how the psychology of uh, the sort of globalized person is, is quite different from uh, in the time of the Buddha or um, 
uh, so in other parts of the world. Um, I had a, uh, a sort of pattern come up really strongly that I, I have seen in a lot of other people as well. Uh, and this is what I would call the inner critic, or um, I like to call mine the, the should voice. So basically, I was, I was on retreat. The only thing I needed to do was uh, meditate, eat, and sleep, <laughs> essentially. Um, and I was going about my days. Uh, this was probably about uh, a few days to maybe a week in. And I realized that I had this sort of nagging mental loop that was telling me that I was doing everything wrong. Um, so it started out by saying things like, you know, uh, you sat for eight hours that day, but maybe you should be going for 10. Um, and then it eventually got to the point where it was saying things like, um, you really should be eating breakfast better, you know? Like, <laughs> I was doing something wrong, like I was taking too much time for breakfast or I wasn't washing the dishes properly. Um, and I realized that like there was just this pattern going on that seemed to be kind of universally critical of anything I did. Um, I couldn't really appease it in any way through um, doing the task that I had at hand well. Um, it was always going to be critical. Um, and it didn't really seem to have any kind of um, logical reasoning behind it. You know, I, I was on retreat, there was, there was no feedback or evidence that I was doing anything wrong as such. Um, and so uh, that's, that's the first thing I, I wanted to kind of mention. Um, I think, yeah, at the time of the Buddha, I don't think there was anyone that really either didn't have this, they didn't have this problem at all or it wasn't kind of acknowledged. Um, but people that I talk to uh, always have this. Um, there's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Everybody. <laughs> there's just always a sort of uh, pattern or uh, a voice or a feeling of uh, doing things wrong even when uh, you are actually certain uh, from all the feedback and from all the information that you have that uh, things are, are going according to plan. Um, so I'm going to sort of... Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll sort of sidestep here and talk about some of the ways that I, I worked with these, uh, the different content. Um, so the way I like to think about meditation is that, well, one of the ways I like to think about it, is that it gives us a range of uh, different ways of looking that are available or different lenses. So I draw quite heavily on Rob Bebea's teaching around this, um, but essentially that when we meditate, we learn to be able to look at experience in certain ways. And when we learn different ways of looking at experience, uh, it can uh, widen the range of possibilities. It can reduce suffering. It can open freedom. Uh, it can uh, also help us to work with uh, content by like looking at it from a, a different perspective as such. Um, and so uh, I guess the one of the first things that we've been, uh, the first meditation we did, oh, sorry, the meditation we did just then, uh, ignoring the content, I think is actually one of the key ideas of um, meditation practice, that if we ignore the content, um, sometimes it actually just gets better. <laughs> um, so uh, this is sometimes talked about as purification, um, which we could, uh, I guess, uh, maybe to summarize, uh, think of as in meditation, as we settle the mind and allow the mind to become collected, uh, the material from the subconscious kind of rises up and comes into consciousness and is somehow uh, resolved or, or those, uh, the, those parts of the mind somehow kind of get on board and become aligned with the, with the sort of overall direction that the mind is moving in. Um, and my experience of this is that uh, this does happen and it helps a lot. Um, certainly when I first started practicing, I would get a lot of content coming up that, uh, you know, things I hadn't thought about for a long time, uh, emotions that would come up that didn't necessarily have content next to it or uh, associated with it. Um, also just, uh, you know, patterns of thinking, uh, that kind of thing would kind of come up and just sort of 
be there and I'd keep ignoring it and it would kind of resolve in a way. Uh, and like Tucker was saying, some of those things were things that were quite traumatic and then they were no longer triggering in the same way. Uh, and so purification does work to an extent. <laughs> and I think that's one of the keys is that uh, I don't think purification is the only process that, that you need. Um, so it can help with a lot of, a lot of stuff, uh, but it doesn't seem to get to the bottom of the, the pond as, as we were um, using that analogy. Um, so um, another way of uh, working particularly with that pattern of the inner critic um, was to practice a lot of uh, metta and uh, self-compassion. Um, I just found that those practices um, as a way of looking but also as a sort of cultivation practice like uh, sort of repeating this intention actually did seem to change the mind over time and change how I could look at that content and see those patterns as um, uh, see, see those patterns but also see my uh, myself in a in a better light um, another uh, sort of aspect of content that was coming up. Um, I think this is a pretty common experience on retreat, is um, l like what I'm talking about, material kind of rising up from the subconscious. Um, it felt on this particular retreat like my mind was trying to put together a like very detailed case against me for why, <laughs> basically to try and prove that I was a bad person. Um, uh, so like one of the things that my mind was doing was like bringing up memories from uh, 10 years ago that was like one bad thing I did, or and maybe even bad's too strong a word. One thing I did that was like not the way I would handle it now. <laughs> and sort of saying like, hey, look at this, this is proof. This is proof you're, you're bad and you need to like change things or do more. Um, and uh, this was quite difficult, right? Um, who's had this experience on retreat where content comes up and it's, it's difficult, but it's, uh, you can kind of get through it. Maybe, can I get some hands up for that? Okay, great. Um, so if you've had this experience, you, you know that it's difficult, but it's meaningful, right? Like working through it uh, helps create more space and then after you can see that uh, without getting triggered it, it creates this lightness and openness um, the the last uh, sort of type way that content was um, coming up for me that I that I want to mention um, is feeling in particularly in the meditation practice feeling like there was um, energy that was stuck in the body or uh, tightness in, like in the muscles or feeling like there was a, uh, there were emotions trapped in the body um, so I had an experience of like um, first I was like feeling like my shoulder was a bit sore and I thought that was funny like oh maybe I, I uh, you know pushed a bit too hard in yoga or something I hurt my shoulder and uh, I kept going for a bit longer and I realized oh it completely disappears as soon as I get up from meditation there's just something there that's um, when my mind kind of settles and I have that level of clarity, that um, access to what's going on, I can see this like tightness and tension. At one point it felt like someone had stabbed me in the back with a knife, like kind of just next to my shoulder blade. Um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, very kind of, um, it felt difficult and painful. Um, but certainly um, compared to uh, having a case made against you with all your uh, bad memories. Uh, a little pain in the body felt like a relief. <laughs> um, so uh, just a couple more ways of working with the content uh, that I want to mention. Uh, one is that I, uh, so prior to doing the retreat and in a, a sort of ongoing way, I've been uh, doing therapy and uh, sort of in therapy but also in meditation sometimes the line is a bit blurred of course I, I was doing uh, different forms of um, sort of working with emotions or working with parts uh, so one of the ways that I would work with what was going on was to um, 
sort of engage with the content as it's felt in the body and as those patterns of thought appear in the mind and trying to uh, like talk to it or to, to work with it, um, to approach it in a sort of uh, kind and compassionate way and then actually see if I could help it to get what it needs so that it would get on board. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that in, in a little bit. Um, and then maybe the final point I, I'd like to make about this is um, the, the retreat was really, really beneficial to me in a number of ways. Um, it also felt like a real roller coaster and like a slog. Um, use that word slog here, right? Um, yeah, so. yeah, we can say slog. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'm not sure. Um, maybe I can find some Australian only words. Um, it felt really, um, it felt kind of arduous, like it was, it was weighing on me. I felt a bit tired from it. And at one point I was talking to Tucker, I think it was about 20 days in, and I sort of said like, it feels really hard, right? Like, I've been really working to get, uh, to get right effort, to have this balanced approach of like figuring out how to move the mind in ways that uh, wasn't, I wasn't using meditation to beat myself up. I was actually moving the mind in these light, intentional ways and being kind to myself while I did it. I was really working on that and I'd made progress, but there was still just like blockages and tension and mental content that was just coming and like fucking things up. Um, so um, at some point we, we talked about it and uh, we sort of said like, maybe I should actually just go under it. <laughs> And this obviously doesn't work for everybody, um, but maybe, I guess because I'd had a, a, a fair bit of practice of the, in doing this, and also um, it was 20 days into a retreat, um, <laughs> I switched to doing uh, like shikantaza variation, uh, basically uh, dropping the ball, if you've done Michael Taft's classes, um, just like going under it, like anything that came up, just go under it. And actually that worked amazingly for the last uh, 10 days. I had pretty much no difficulty. Everything became much lighter and much easier. And I think that's, that's sort of what we're kind of talking about here is like, when the Dharma does work, it works amazingly. Um, and when it doesn't work, uh, that's when we need all these, all these other tools, all these other systems um, and uh, different ways of looking at what's going on. Well, let's, uh, oh, yes. yeah, what's it? What do you mean by go under it? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, are you familiar with, with that practice, the, like, shikantaza or, uh, sometimes it's called, like, do nothing. I think the better translation is, like, silent illumination, but essentially the only instruction is whatever comes up, um, you don't engage with it. So, uh, there's, there's no object that you're paying attention to, there's no intention of something you're trying to do. Um, uh, even if you notice your attention being like going to something, you kind of let go of that uh, as to whatever degree you can. So going under it in that case refers to uh, throughout that retreat, I'd been like, you know, the inner critic would come up and I'd try and work with it. I'd be like, oh, okay, now maybe I should do some meta. Or maybe I need to like, maybe I need to try and work with it in some way. Uh, so going under was just like, oh, that's that, I don't care. I'm just like, uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I think because I'm Australian, I'd like uh, to use a surfing analogy here or, <laughs> or maybe just a uh, swimming in uh, very like rough waves. Like when you dive under the wave, uh, the wave actually barely affects you, right? Um, and so that's, that's what I was picturing. Like the, the waves would keep crashing and I just keep diving under them. So let's take like a 30 second stretch break before we do another meditation. <clears throat> We're gonna do a content one here. I wasn't planning to guide the stretching. <laughs> the guiding will be you do you. Great. Well, I did me. <laughs> mm. 
Okay. I guess I just have this rinky dink one here, but that's okay. Well, let's find our meditation posture. Ooh, that's pretty. <laughs> and the way I'm gonna guide this is with a few different steps where each step is gonna get more advanced, harder. Just like in yoga, you know, the teacher tells you to touch your toes and then eventually by step four, she's like hanging from the ceiling by her elbows kind of thing. And of course you only go as far as makes sense to you. So what I'd like you to do first is allow the attention to move freely around the body. And what we're especially looking for is body sensations that don't seem to have any obvious physical cause. So the easiest sensation to feel is the pressure of your butt and your body against the chair or the, the cushion. Uh, your clothes are pretty easy. What we're especially looking for is anything inside the body. Often this is gonna be in the center of your body, starting in about your neck, ending around your belt buckle. We'll take just a minute or two. What we'll do is let the attention wander among body sensations. We especially care about this sort of body sensation. I'm going to keep the attention both in the vertical center of the body, right, from the neck to the belt buckle, and also can help to find these in the physical center of the body. So looking at what's happening halfway between your chest and your back. And if few of these sensations, maybe your heartbeat is the loudest or uh, feelings in your stomach of being full or hungry. A few of these are going to be what we could call organic sensations. But most of these, for most of us, are going to be what we would call psychogenic sensations. They are emotions that you're noticing in the bodily sense. And you can notice the way emotions often present in the body. We seem more likely to notice the negative ones and the positive ones. These negative emotions in the body are gonna feel like a blockage, a clenching, tightness, pain, darkness. Sometimes it'll look opaque. Some part of your body just feels like nothing. And the good ones are gonna feel the opposite. Positive emotions will feel like expansion, openness. Sometimes it'll feel like a candle flame, a flashlight. And sometimes I'll hear people talk about bubbles. 
like uh, like in champagne or like you're sitting in a hot tub. And so the first thing we'll try is just looking for these sensations in the body. And if you think you can do it, if you understand the instruction, try next to look for emotional sensations in the body. And these are the two ways you can tell the sensations of the body are emotional. They have no obvious organic or external cause. And they're going to have this clenching or this opening sensation to them, this contra contraction or expansion sensation. So option one is scan the body. Option two is scan the body specifically for these emotions. And we'll spend a little while doing option three, if you'd like. Option three is going to be a noting practice. So Kainan was walking you through a concentration practice where you'll pick something and keep your attention there. This is the opposite of that, really. You will let the attention move wherever it wants to go in the body, among any of these emotional sensations. And when it lands on a sensation, give it the most specific name you can. So you'll be labeling these sensations in your head. Use the most specific label you can figure out in about two seconds. You don't want to spend too much time thinking about the sensation. So sometimes you won't get a very specific label. You'll get something like pain, tension, I to do this in my own body. I can feel the places where I label pain or tension. And then sometimes as you look at the pain or the tension, you start noticing what's actually behind it, right? Bodies don't often just tense up and feel pain for no reason. What is in there? And so that's what I mean by the most specific label we can. If you can notice that the pain or tension is actually fear, saying the word fear in your head, and then drop that sensation and see what else is going on in the body. Find another one, give it the most specific label you can, drop it, see what else is going on. If something strong is going on for you, you may find that you just label the same thing over and over. That, that doubt, that not good enough feeling that kind of was talking about, for many of us tends to be pretty pervasive. And as you meditate, if you look inside, what you might find is fear that you're doing this wrong, fear that you'll never succeed, fear that everyone else is doing this right, and you're not, and so on. Something like that can be real sticky, where the attention will come back and back. So it doesn't actually matter whether you wind up labeling the same thing whether you keep labeling different things. So we label stuff, we'll just see how accurately we can name it. So the first example was tension. The second was fear. You might notice you're tensing your body because you're afraid. Third, more specific example might be afraid you're not doing the meditation right. Afraid you're disappointing the person sitting next to you. Jealous of the person next to you. Suddenly peaceful and relaxed. Noticing that you can just name emotions without trying to change them. I've seen that pattern a lot when I've done this. That If you get decent at labeling some of the bad ones, that will bring on the good ones. Might be lucky enough to just have the good ones. One really cheap trick you can try occasionally is smile as though you were really happy 
It's okay if it's a totally fake smile. And often if you look at the center of the chest when you do that, you get that light, luminosity, openness as soon as you smile. So one possibility is this is going pretty well. <clears throat> You're feeling lots of sensations and able to label them. Another possibility is nothing is happening. There's something you can do about that. It can be intense. If you're in a place where nothing is happening, where it feels like the body is empty or numb, notice what that emptiness or numbness feels like. The same way that you all have your eyes closed right now. If I asked you what you were looking at, what you saw, you might say nothing. I could say, look at that nothing, and you'd notice you don't see nothing at all. You see blackness, and the blackness has depth, and it has texture, and there's like flashes of color. That what you thought was seeing nothing is actually lots of information that you were missing. The same way, if the body seems nice and loud, just keep following. <laughs> And if the body feels sort of empty or numb, look at what having an empty, numb body feels like, and you can label those components. <laughs> the dog noises are just making me label happy. So if you're familiar with <clears throat> uh, what would be called Mahasi noting, it's a, a pretty common technique, or what Shinzen Yang does with the see, hear, feel, it's a very light touch, right? You just touch the sensation and you leave. This isn't quite like that. This is a piercing, investigative sort of attention. Right? As we see the emotion sensations, we're looking, peering into them, trying to see what's going on. If you have a lot of meditation experience, you might notice that you can take all of these sensations and dissolve them into emptiness. Notice that there's no such thing as fear. There's thoughts in your head, there's these different buzzing sensations in the body. The fear is ultimately empty. And, for a strange instruction, if you can do that, don't. Don't do that. That undercuts seeing the content. In this case, rather than just dissolving or practicing non-attachment to the various positive and negative emotion, our goal is to map them, learn them, understand them.
one thing I find when I do this is often before I started this, some emotion feels stuck. Some part of my body can't relax. Some emotion is coloring the way I perceive the world. <clears throat> and often as I do this, they start flowing. They start changing much more rapidly. And so I'm now gonna suggest the fourth and final idea for what you can do in this set. And this may be the hanging by your elbows sort of maneuver. If you don't think you can do that, or if you try it and it feels like you're just looping on thoughts in your head, uh, abandon it and go back to whichever of these options is working for you. The idea is if you find an emotion that seems loud, try talking to it and interacting with it. So it might look like this. If you find sadness, try talking to it as though it were a different person who was sad. Validation might help. Hello, sadness. I see you there. Questions like, what makes you so sad? What do you need? How can I help? You can see why I would call this advanced. It would be very easy to have a superficial conversation with your own thoughts, right? If it's working, if you're actually able to converse with the emotion, there's a couple ways you can tell. One is the part of you that's being the, the grown up, the healer, it will feel spatially high. It will probably be up in your head. The emotion talking will feel lower. It will feel often like it's coming from your chest when it responds. Another way you might know it's working is if it says things you didn't know already, things you didn't expect, a form of self-therapy. You can actually learn new information from your unconscious mind. And one way you might know it's failing is if there's sort of lengthy discussion, high vocabulary, hypothesizing, any of that, is an indicator to try again or to go back to the previous one. So if you find sadness and you say, why are you sad? It should tell you, you know, I miss somebody who died. I wish I were better at meditation. Sounds more like, well, I don't know. It's hard to tell what sadness comes from. It could be about this thing. It could be about that other thing. I wonder how I tell the difference between the uh, cut, right? <laughs> Go back to the body and just keep looking for emotion. We'll need one stable enough if you want to try this last technique. You'll need an emotion loud enough, heavy enough, stable enough. That you'll be able to actually go into it like that. And so we'll sit mostly quiet for the remainder of the meditation. Using whichever one of these works best for you. And if you want to try this talking thing, feel free to just keep talking in the same emotion. If the talking helps the emotion heal, or if it just doesn't work, zoom back out and find the emotion sensation in the body do it like you're doing before. So we'll do step three, finding and labeling the emotions. Unless one of them seems loud enough, and then you can try talking with it, try healing it, try being a kind of loving, responsible grown-up. It's often childlike emotional parts. And if that really succeeds and something feels healed, or if that really fails and you just get distracted or talking to yourself in your head, in either case, that goes well or that doesn't. 
Let's go back to looking for emotion sensations in the body. your eyes closed staying in the meditation just put your hand up if you're having some luck with the part talking cool okay I like to always think when I'm talking with the part Thinking of it like a kid, thinking of that emotion like a kid. And how I would help or love or heal a kid who was feeling that way. Being loving, present, open, patient, right? You don't demand that the kid tell you your feelings, tell you their feelings. It almost communicates to them to stop talking. inquisitive what do you need how can I help what will make you feel better there's a sense of allowing there right you're not trying to shut the emotion down that tends to be our usual MO
and in just a moment I'm going to ring the bell. I'm going to do the 20 minutes left in a workshop this evening. And so I'd like to ask everybody to stay put for the next 20 minutes. Hi. Welcome back. Um, anybody feel like sharing how that went? Yeah, go ahead, Gabriel. Um, yeah, so this is the first time I've done something like that, I guess, I don't know, it was step four, the last step. Um, so yeah, it was very strange. Um, I felt a tension in my head, very similar to the headache. Um, but I almost never get headaches. Um, yeah, and to me, it felt, and it's hard, right, because like this is a completely <coughs> subjective thing. Um, yeah, that this tension came from a place where I felt I needed to be kind of tense and concentrated to like function mm -hmm. in general. Cool. Cool. Wow, congratulations. That's a big insight. Yeah, and so I mean in general, right, it's like hard to relax or you know, do a lot of things when it's kind of just like to me in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is not safe to chill out. Right. That's very cool to find that in there. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, yeah, what's your name? Anil. Anil? Hi. Yeah. So for me, uh, the hard part was actually feeling it in the body. So that was difficult. But talking with the emotion was uh, comparatively easy. So, <laughs> cool. Right. And I can share my little anxiety I was feeling. But I feel that I could, uh, I could have a conversation. So that was <laughs> interesting. I couldn't tell you where I felt. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, uh, I have pretty big like firefighter and exile parts in IFS. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, whenever random thoughts would come, I would just like have to react by like slouching or doing some physical movement to handle like the intense emotion. And um, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of hard to um, stay still. Um, I I've had better luck with just like like being strict and being like, yeah, you can't think, like shut down the mind and just focus on like extreme body sensations instead of thoughts because like thoughts are like super hard to handle. Um, that, that the, the thoughts are too slippery so you stay with the, you stay with a lot of body sensations, you say? Uh, well, that's what I've done historically. Um, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty good advice. <clears throat> uh, the thoughts just tend to be so deceitful, you know? Especially, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the Buddha suttas, the Buddha says the biggest distraction is going to be thinking about sex. And I don't know about all of you, but among the nerds that I tend to work with, very rarely get complaints about sex distractions. Thinking about meditation <laughs> is the thing that all my students seem to be lusting after. <laughs> and so there'll be these, all these dumb voices in your head, right? And, you know, one of them's like, what are we going to have for dinner? Should I do that Mexican food thing? And that's pretty easy to let go of. And then it's like, should I do step three or step four? And it doesn't sound like just talk, right? It's like, this is your innermost soul making a critical decision right now. The, the thoughts just tend to do that. They lie to you and say they're the real you. And they, they win a lot. <laughs> so I, I teach the same thing, the idea of, the body doesn't trick you quite as much, um, and so I, I like hanging out there for emotions. Um, so I wanted to address the few questions I got at the beginning, and then open to whatever is on anybody's mind. Um, one thing that was coming up for me as we were doing this is um, this felt like way too little time, like we, uh, we got too big of a topic to try to do in two hours. And I'm like, oh, we're going to do this in Melbourne, you know, in case anybody wants to fly to fucking Melbourne for a non-residential weekend workshop. So uh, one thing maybe is we should do this here one day, um, do, do, do a, a weekend here. Because, um, yeah, this feels, this feels rushed to me. Somebody asked about the shadow, uh, integrating the shadow. And I would actually leave that last meditation as the answer, right? So some of the things you'll find in there are going to be 
deep shadow side for me, I uh, often get like really mad at somebody who I know did not do anything wrong. And it did take years of meditation to notice that this was just anger and I didn't need to act on it. So uh, I would think of this as one answer to the question of how do we integrate the ugly parts of ourselves? Bring them in, you know, welcome them. This child idea when we're working with the emotions, uh, I find really helpful. Who's familiar with the IFS model of psychotherapy? Yeah, in Berkeley you get all the hands always. Um, <laughs> Uh, for those unfamiliar, it stands for internal family systems. It's treating the mind like a dysfunctional family. And so I, I, I trained in grad school in actual family therapy, uh, external family systems. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing that you'll often find messed up in the family is the hierarchy, where like the kids are in charge. And this makes the parents feel stressed, this makes the kids feel unsafe, and everybody in the family will start feeling and behaving better if you can get a proper hierarchy. So as we work with these, with these different emotions, with these different parts, um, we invite them in, we compassionately listen to them, but we don't give them a steering wheel, right? Um, we treat them as children to be loved and cared for, but not to be placed in charge. This is what I think of one way of integrating this, the shadow. There are these boundaries as we do this, right? We really, if the kid is, I hate you, dad, right? We go, okay, well, what makes you hate me so much? But we don't want to let the kid decide whether dad gets punched, right? The kid just does not have the intellect to make a good decision there. <laughs> um, I think I don't want to talk about brains um, just in that one constraint is back when I was in grad school, I was a neuroscience researcher and I knew all this stuff off the top of my head. And my data is going to be pretty old at this point. Um, I think it's a cliche that when you leave school, that is the last piece of research you tend to learn. And uh, I do know some, but I, I would want to prepare more before I, I gave a neuroscience lecture on meditation, particularly because of a meditation neuroscientist in the front row who would know everything I got wrong. So if we do a weekend here, I think maybe we'll, rec we'll pull Katie out of her civilian posture there and, and maybe maybe she'll come, she'll come help out. Maybe. <laughs> um, Jason asked about stream entry. I'm teaching a 17 day retreat starting on Friday in Arizona. I think there might be one or two spaces. I really don't think any of you are prepared to leave your life and go into total silence for 17 days this Friday. But <laughs> the point being, uh, I'm teaching the 17-day retreat and I'm bringing a new prop with me. I'm bringing a water pistol. <laughs> because last year when I taught the retreat, like more than half the people would start their interviews doing something like this. Look, I know that there's no like good meditation or bad meditation and it's not about like getting stuff but anyways i want to get blank please give me the real instructions that you haven't yet given to the other students that will cause me to get that right so every dharma teacher oh besides my friend daniel ingram every <laughs> every other dharma teacher <laughs> gives you very similar advice of like don't lust after states right wanting stream entry. Uh, stream entry in Buddhist uh, theology, philosophy, cosmology, whatever word you want to use, is the, the first stage of awakening. In the original Theravada, the Pali Canon, there's four stages. Almost every Dharma teacher will tell you, don't try to get stream entry. The attempt to get stream entry is your number one obstacle to that ever happening. And the reason I'm bringing the water pistol is that that is true. <laughs> And all my students come in demanding, and you know, I teach for donations. So customer service really has to be my livelihood. If people leave disappointed, they don't have to pay me anything. Um, but fuck customer service. I'm gonna open fire on them with a water pistol if they demand that I, I explain to them how to get these states. Um, uh, stream entry is just a bad motivation for practice in that you don't know what it means until you get it. Also, it's a much lower 
stage of the path than you're expecting until you've got them. Uh, I don't know how many dozens or hundreds of my students would have gotten to a place that, at least on my map, I would call stream entry. Everyone defines it totally differently. The canonical definitions are, are bordering on useless in terms of operationalizing who's right and, and, and who's wrong. So uh, one problem is like, you don't really know what it is. And if you picture a horse, you know, running with a carrot on a stick in front of it, carrots seem great, the horse will run. Note, I have no idea whether that's a real thing. I, the horses I've known have been fairly intelligent, and I just don't see them chasing a carrot that relative to them is stationary for very long. Not important. We could imagine that a dumb horse might do such a thing. If in front of the horse is like a box with a question mark, it's not going to move, right? The, the big reason that trying to get jhana, trying to get stream entry is an obstacle to getting that is what these, what these successes come from is being alert and awake in the present moment, being here right now. When people say to the Buddha, what happened to you under that tree? There are a few different ways he describes it. Uh, one, like the simplest way he'll describe it is he'll say, I learned these four noble truths. All of this tanha, all this grasping, trying to make things different in stupid ways, all this trying to control the universe, trying to control the mind. I stopped doing that, and then all of my stress went away. So the idea of like getting jhana, getting stream entry, it's just the opposite of that. Uh, letting go of those things and seeing what is really happening right now is the route to all meditation progress. I sat a jhana retreat over Christmas, and like three, four days, I'm getting nowhere. And finally I'm like, fuck it, I hate jhana. I'm not doing this, I'm just gonna sit here like Pfft. That was it, right? Like, easy access to all the jhanas for the whole rest of the retreat as soon as I said, fuck it. So these will be my brief thoughts on stream entry. Um, your goal is to be, like, honestly present with this moment, and that's it. Um, I don't, a few people have been taking the devices out. I assume people are taking notes on there, but um, I just find people looking at phones really distracting. <laughs> So if, if, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, just maybe taking the notes right when we finish in a few minutes here. Um, and then I've gotten the question about the effect of meditation on psychotherapy. That has been extraordinary. When I was applying to grad school in 2007, I don't want to boast, but my resume was pretty good. I like went to an Ivy League school and I had research experience and like a research experience in like a super good lab and clinical experience. And I was rejected from 27 grad programs over the course of two years and nearly gave up uh, on becoming a psychologist because I kept writing these grad schools and being like, I want to get a PhD in psychology focusing on meditation. I'd be like, don't ever call this number again, sir. Uh, you know, one or two professors actually told me that's not a thing that exists. <laughs> and now. <laughs> It is hard to find therapists who don't meditate. Um, the field has been absolutely turned on its head from uh, this is crazy to this is required. Um, I'm trying to decide if there's anything short I can say. I think no. I think, yeah, merely to say there are a whole bunch of schools of psychotherapy um, for borderline personality, dialectical behavior therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and then they, they keep, uh, seems like they keep rebranding these, uh, uh, you know, heartfulness-based, uh, essentially mindfulness has gotten so unhip, right? It's like in the beginning, it's like really hip, and you wanna do it, and then suddenly everybody's doing it, and you need some new branding. Uh, there's just lots of, uh, lots of schools of psychotherapy that now incorporate or are based on the idea that instead of changing your experience, you change the way you relate to that experience. We've got a whopping five minutes left. I was trying to leave 20 minutes for questions. Does anyone have a question they'd like to know? Yeah, what's your name? Matt. Uh, yeah, I've seen technique questions with the, the practice we did at the end there. Yeah, um, that sounds great. Yeah, some stuff came up for me. 
that was great. I was doing the noting and one thing I know in certain perspectives in psychology, there's the, the somatic feelings that you have um, may be somewhat like meaning neutral and maybe the attributions that we have, maybe the what we're fabricating, constructing might actually determine. Is that excitement or is that anxiety? Um, so, it, it, and I noticed you said don't go to emptiness, don't, don't yeah. let, don't let, don't let yeah. happen, don't let self drift away. So we're preserving maybe mm -hmm. this a little bit of this uh, right, relationship right. with it. Um, yeah, and I found when I was when I was noting, there were some times where I'm like, oh, the answer isn't coming quick, and it's maybe, and I, I felt this question come up. It's like, is the way of looking maybe somewhat dependent on how I categorize this emotion? Um, yeah, I actually don't think so. Um, the 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 question uh, the question is basically like we're trying to label these emotions. Is it semi arbitrary? Am I just feeling some vibration in here? And if I call it excitement, it'll be excitement. And if I call it lust, it'll be lust. I actually don't think so. Um, the other part of your question was around emptiness, uh, dissolving things or not. Uh, if you're new at meditation, this part will not make a lot of sense. As you get good at meditation, you become able to just dissolve stuff. That anything that you see that you like or particularly that you don't like, you can look at it in a certain way that it just evaporates. The thing is, it doesn't really evaporate. Uh, in Buddhism, we talk a lot about the dichotomy of form and emptiness. So uh, emptiness is like there's no such thing as a table. Uh, this table, even scientifically we know, is virtually entirely empty space. Table is a concept I am overlaying on empty space. And there are states of meditation where the table fucking disappears, where it starts blinking in and out of existence. Uh, there are drugs that will cause it to happen. You start to notice this is just a perception, and it's possible to destabilize that perception and notice that there's not really a table. On the flip side, how many times am I going to do this before my stick falls through the table? Infinity, right? <laughs> on one hand, there is no such thing as table. On the other, yes, there is. <laughs> and so this form emptiness dichotomy is true of all phenomena. And especially relevant is it's true of the self. Um, I have had students, you know, pretty often on retreat, get to places where the sense of self is obliterated. And I've never seen someone stay there. The sense of self always comes back. And what's kind of mind-blowing to me is it comes back approximately the same as it left. <clears throat> if you liked vanilla more than chocolate before your Nirvana experience, you still prefer vanilla. I have never had anyone change their sexual orientation as a function of meditation. And look, the gay mafia is paying me to make it happen. <laughs> and, and thus far, I've just, been, I've just been an abysmal failure. It turns out that when the self comes back, it's the same fucking one you had before. I don't understand why this is the case. I'm pretty okay with it. Like, I've spent 40 years operating a tucker. If I, like, suddenly had to operate a mat, I'd, like, be starting from scratch, you know? Um... But so this is why I would teach this practice of intentionally not dissolving, total dissolving is spiritual bypassing. I've known a few people who are simultaneously what we could call enlightened and psychotic. Uh, their egos were so dysfunctional and the only technique they had was dissolve them. And so they could spend periods of time like in bliss. And when the bliss collapsed, they were insane. They needed care. Uh, just to get through the day. This is obviously the most extreme version, but you are going to continue to be you at least until you die. And um, uh, I don't know what happens after that. And if someone says they do, I suggest you talk to someone else instead. <laughs> so this is the idea of, of not dissolving it, uh, working with it. And I, I, I don't actually find the self to be arbitrary. Like, uh, if I name two cookies, we're gonna pretend I'm gonna give you a cookie. Oh, you know what? We actually did bring junk food with us. Uh, outside we have apple strudel and moon cakes. So I just want you to think which one you're gonna take when you go out there, apple strudel or moon cakes. 
And then I'd like you to reflect on how you made that decision. <laughs> you probably didn't sort of crunch the relative health value of either, spoiler alert, terrible on both sides. <laughs> um, there's just this like feeling that shows up that seems very stable. In Buddhism, this is called Vedana. And in, in Buddhist uh, philosophy, Vedana is fairly invariant. Like if the Buddha, uh, if the Buddha liked vanilla more than chocolate as a baby, he likes vanilla more than chocolate as the Buddha. So uh, this is the benefit of exploring the content. We're actually at eight o'clock. Um, one really optimistic thing I noticed is that even though like more than half of you went up to pee at some point, everybody came back, which. <laughs> made me suspect that actually we should do a much longer version of this one day. Um, well, thank you all for coming. I hope this gave you a nice introduction. Um, wet your appetite to come back for the longer one, which we've just decided is going to happen. <laughs> and um, we had promised Mexican food. Uh, who's planning to come for, for food? Uh, keep your hands up. I just want to get, when we get to the rest, I want to be able to give a number. Uh, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and a half. Okay. Um, so we, I don't know, did I count Sorry both of you? Sorry, we <laughs> Okay. So we might wind up at different tables. Katie, where are we going? Casa Latina. Casa, oh, that's San easy. Pablo. And it's like an order at the counter, and then they give you a number, and then you go to the table, so it's like very casual. So, awesome. Yeah, and there's a big table in the back, uh, which is hopefully it opens. So uh, let me quickly do our pitching, and then Katie will do her. There must be some more polite word. I like um, telling everyone what an Olympic is. I do that like once or twice a week. So I'll get great. A I don't remember. Okay. So um, our yeah. pitching would be. <laughs> so um, I teach a uh, I teach a class on Monday nights uh, with Kynan in San Francisco. I teach it in person. Uh, Kynan is teaching it in person this Monday, but the constraints of flying here from Sydney every Monday for a 90-minute free <laughs> class are extraordinary. So. <laughs> Uh, Monday in San Fran in the Mission, uh, 7.30 to 9 uh, every week. And for 10 and a half years, I've been teaching an advanced meditation class every Tuesday. It's uh, 5.30 p.m. San Francisco time. There's also a morning one at 6 p.m. London time, which is either 10 or 11 here, depending on daylight savings time. If you wanted to join either of those, just email me. Uh, my name is Tucker Peck. I'm easy to find on Google. It's almost all my meditation and psychology hits. Also, there's a guy from Utah called Tucker J. Peck, who's like a mentally ill, severe criminal. And so if you keep <laughs> scrolling, you'll get his mug shots, like newspaper stories about the horrifying things he's done. But almost all of the Tucker Pecks are from me, Tucker S. Peck. <laughs> he doesn't look that much like me, but he's like a white guy with dark hair. He's only a little bit younger than me. I don't think anyone has ever confused us. Anyways, that part's really not important. Um, <laughs> if you don't have my contact info, Google me, you'll get it, and some horrifying newspaper stories. Um, so yeah, I have the Monday evening class in the city. I have the virtual advanced meditation classes on Tuesdays. Um, if you want to come on Tuesdays and don't feel quite advanced, Kynan teaches a, uh, like an intro to that uh, sort of a class. And then I teach her treats around the world. I am trying to get a Berkeley one going in um, like t uh, three night retreat in Berkeley, like January 20th vicinity. I'm just waiting for confirmation that the venue is available. Um, I, I do have a psychotherapy practice and I'm licensed in California and I take one-on-one -on -one meditation students, but I have quite a long wait list for that. Um, so if you're looking for a one-on-one -on -one meditation teacher, kind of tell them all the things you do. Yeah. So, um, I, as Taka said, I teach the course that sort of leads into eSangha. It's called Dharma Foundations. Um, the next one uh, may be running later this year, I'm not sure. If not that, there's uh, a course I'm going to co-teach with Upali that starts in January. Um, that will be about sort of establishing and deepening your meditation practice. Um, I also teach a bunch of classes, but they're mostly Australian time, which is terrible for <laughs> here. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm available to meet one-on-one -on -one with students via Zoom um, at, uh, on sliding scale payments. So you can check out my website uh, for that information. Kynanmeditation.net. Um, 
I don't remember what an Olympic is, so please come oh, up. Oh, well, Tucker, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, I see a few new faces. How many of you have not been here before? That's awesome. Welcome to the Olympic. So we named this place uh, Alembic because an Alembic is an alchemical vessel. It's a sacred container yeah. for transformation. Um, Alembics are still used in distillation. It's just a still. Uh, but the alchemists believed that the substance that you put into the Alembic would not transform unless conditions in the world were correct and conditions in your mind were correct for that particular situation. So an Alembic is a sacred vessel where mind and matter meet and transform. And that's very much our aspiration for this space. So we want to be a container for transformation according to whatever your own goals are. And to that end, we run classes, events, workshops. We have the occasional giant party. Um, and all of those are around the area of meditation and movement, neuroscience, psychedelics, and psychedelic integration with a thread of creativity running through the whole thing. So the idea is that anyone can come here and find something that resonates with them that brings them closer to, um, to whatever their goal is in that moment. Um, so coming up this week, we have, coming up this month actually, uh, every Monday night for four Mondays, we have Ronya Ver, who is from like Contact Improv World. She's going to be here every Monday doing a workshop. And it lasts for four weeks. You can come to one, you can come to all four, it's up to you. So that's Monday nights. On Tuesday nights, starting on the 20th, we have Chandra Easton. Uh, she's doing a class called Relaxing into Presence, Meditation, Mantra, and Movement. So she's going to be, um, she's, every now and then she's going to bring her harmonium um, and she has like some musicians who are going to come with her. She sat in uh, recently for Michael Taft and we did some like really beautiful chanting and singing. She is also just like an amazing wizard dress and can like <laughs> guide the heck out of a meditate. Like she's really good. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to be on Tuesdays. On Wednesdays we have Kelly Boys doing non-sleep deep rest on Zoom. So you can do that from your own bed. Uh, which I highly recommend. Like, you will fall asleep, but it'll be great. Um, and then Thursday nights, we have Michael Taft uh, doing Deconstructing Yourself. So that's a, that's a, given how much you all got up, maybe you shouldn't come to that, because we sit for an hour, like, uh, without moving. So if you're, if you're up for that, that's on Thursday nights. And we have Qigong. Uh, we have a couple yoga classes. I keep saying that the best way to know what's going on with us is to sign up for the mailing list. Uh, where the newsletter is supposed to go, but then I keep not writing the newsletter. So honestly, like, <laughs> are, how many of you are on uh, Twitter? Some of you. Okay, that's like actually the for real best way is just follow us on Twitter, and that's Berkeley Alembic. Um, we're about to have a professional writer in house who's going to start writing the newsletter, so you can sign up for that uh, in the lobby. Is and then Twitter for old people? Is that why nobody's on it? Anymore? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> who's on TikTok? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, makes you angry. That's why I'm not. oh, you gotta find the right corner of Twitter, and it's like delightful on there. You just have to find. Anyway, whatever. Um, this isn't a sales pitch for Twitter. Um, Kelly's on TikTok, the non sleep deep rest. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you can sign up for the mailing list in the lobby and come back. Um, come back and sit. Come back and move. Come to a party. Come to a special event. It's really great to see you all. Uh, and if you have other questions about like stuff that's going on here, or if you want to volunteer, um, you can talk to one of us. Uh, there's all sorts of ways to get involved in the community. We just opened. We had our grand opening party July 30th, so we're brand new. Um, and if you want to get involved, there are plenty of ways. So talk to me after this. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Tucker. And, uh, Thank you, Kyan. Appreciate you being here. Since it's already 8.10 on a school night, <clears throat> let's try to leave the Olympic pretty quickly uh, so we can get to dinner. And so Katie, who has to lock up after us, can get out and join us at dinner. Yeah. And hopefully I will see most of you shortly over tacos.